water log. Where did you put in today? Lost Creek. Five hours down the road. What is your name? Uh, Lee Heisel. What do you do for a living? I'm a director of learning resources at Austin Community College. Well, I'm going to vote for SOS because uh, the springs is like uh, one of the things that we do right in Austin. You know, it's one of the things that makes this, I mean, we put in down there and within, you know, two minutes we're in wilderness. I mean, not even two minutes. I mean, we're just around the bend and we're in this wilderness. And, uh, I mean, it's just, it's one of the, one of the things that makes this, this community so special. There's something different about Austin. It's called Barton Creek. It's so different, there's nothing like it anywhere else in America. And for all our history, it's helped make this a special place. Barton Creek is millions of years old. It twists and turns and cuts through mile after mile of hill country limestone. In fact, there's nowhere else in America where a wilderness creek brings clean water and so much solitude to the heart of a major city. It's all woods and rock and green water. And when you're down there, you think you're alone in a wilderness. But up over the bluffs, over the cliffs, there are freeways, subdivisions, and shopping malls. You know, you can go to shopping malls in New Jersey, but you can only go down Barton Creek in Austin, Texas. Sherman once said, if he had a choice between hell and Texas, he'd rent out Texas and live in hell. The general never swam in Barton Springs, but everyone else did. It was always clear and it was always cold, and that was no small thing in a town that was built on the same latitude as Cairo, Egypt. They loved that water. Everybody cooled off there in the summer, there were water shows at Deep Eddy and Barton Springs featuring a diving horse and the world champion diving baby. Colonel Zilker owned the land and in 1918 he gave it to the city, which also needed the springs for its public water supply. In fact, that crystal clear 27 million gallons a day from Barton Springs was a big reason Austin had been made the state capital in the first place. My first swim in Barton's pool was 1923. That's a good while ago. Well, at that time, it was just a swimming hole. In 1923, I was 10 years old. Well, the configuration of this pool uh, actually occurred when we built the lower dam in 1929. Billboards were put out advertising Barton Springs. We had a huge dance floor up on top, open air pavilion. I used to have a lot of fun running dances out there in the summertime and doing intermissions. I'd come down here and get in my I swim clothes and go and lie in the spring for five minutes and go back and I'd be relatively cool. Well, how far is it from New York to Los Angeles? I looked it up on a map, 2,820 miles. And I swam that in 2,714 swim days. There's been a magic about this water. There's something that's different. I like to say that Barton's is like heaven, more a state than a place. It's been a 150-year love affair between the city and its creek. It's a blessing to grow up here, and it's a joy to be here. Barton Creek and Barton Springs have nurtured us and taught us and soothed us and helped make us glad to be alive.
Circle C developer Gary Bradley is a rich man. But he didn't pay $100 million of his SNL loans. Now taxpayers are paying his bad debts for him. Circle C residents pay no city taxes, but the Austin City Council voted to pay 85% of the cost of giving them utilities. Question, and how many people are going to live out there? Bradley, eight to 10,000 homes ultimately. Question, that could be 40 to 50,000 people. Bradley, yes, you're basically building a new town. Jim Bob Moffitt, leader of the developer group opposing the SOS ordinance. When he's at his luxurious Barton Creek development, he lives in a company mansion behind locked gates on a street closed to the general public. But Moffitt isn't in Austin very much. He's head of Freeport McMoran, a gigantic Louisiana mining and chemical company. Moffitt's company is ranked as the largest discharger of waterborne pollutants in the United States. Freeport once asked Louisiana for permits to dump over three million tons of radioactive gypsum a year into the Mississippi River. Now Jim Bob is moving into the golf course and real estate business. He proposes to put 5,000 houses and condos, a new golf course, and two and a half million square feet of commercial development on Virgin Hills along Barton Creek. At Moffitt's Barton Creek Country Club, memberships cost $28,000, not counting monthly dues. But golf balls won't be the only thing going into the creek. Moffitt's proposed development will generate over one and a half million gallons of treated sewage and wastewater every day. It will be held in ponds or used to irrigate the golf courses, and it will drain, seep, and filter down to Barton Creek or into the aquifer. Actually, a small army of developers has already begun nibbling away at the watersheds that give Barton Creek its water. Austin is lucky to have a green corridor so close to its heart, but urban development is close and getting closer. In a few years, the empty spaces will be filled in, concrete will cover much of the green, and Barton's will be urbanized. In fact, at the present rate, developers could eventually put over 200,000 extra people in this area. We would be building not one, but two cities the size of Waco out on Barton Creek. Five hundred years ago, a chap by the name of John Everard, who was the local butcher in the little town of Foxton in East Anglia in England, permitted his dunghill uh, to wash into the common stream, and the village fined and prohibited him from doing that in the future. June 1990, a city environmental department memo states, there is an observable difference in water quality in the creek adjacent to the existing Barton Creek Country Club golf course. Attorney John Scanlon, former chairman of the Governor's Committee on Water Quality for the Highland Lakes. It's uncanny that 500 years later, we've got the same problem. We've got a golf course that's irrigated with partially treated wastewater, and it is contaminating Barton Creek. It's no different than John Everard's dunghill. Spring 1990, the U.S. Geological Survey discovers a dramatic difference in Barton Creek before and after it enters developed areas. Upstream, in a rural setting, the water is clear. Downstream, below the development, there are periods of drastically higher levels of fecal coliform, bacteria, elevated levels of phosphorus, nitrogen, and suspended solids. There is a drastic increase of algae blooms, a strong indication of polluted water. Scientist Tom Schuler, a nationally recognized expert on pollution control. There's a limit to growth and that threshold is probably very low in this watershed. All the ponds and filters and, and buffers uh, help, but they are not sufficient to, to preserve the quality of the stream. 
The only thing that you can, that we know that will work without any exception is to reduce density so that the human development is low enough to permit the native landscape and lands to absorb uh, human activity on it. And you can do that. And that's what the SOS ordinance purports to do. September 1990, a government scientist states, there is something happening in Barton Creek. The things we see increasing are things associated with sewage. Referring to the proposed Barton Creek Resort project, he says, there will be some degradation of Barton Creek with any development of that size. Impervious cover are the rooftops, the roadways, the parking lots, the sidewalks that are part of the urban landscape. Why is imperviousness so important? Well, imperviousness has a very controlling influence on a stream. It, it increases the quantity of runoff, the floods, the velocity of water, reduces the recharge. It's a very efficient collector of pollutants, and they become washed off into our stream systems. Things like oil and grease, sediment, trace metals, some pesticides and others go into our important lakes and streams. In watersheds that are sensitive as Barton Creek, there is a threshold. And once it's surpassed at maybe 10 or 15 or 20 percent, the watershed is on a trajectory downward. Humpty Dumpty falls off the wall, and it's impossible, even with the best of engineering, to put Humpty Dumpty back together again. The U.S. Supreme Court has clearly stated the government, meaning the city, may prevent one property owner from using his property in a way that harms the public welfare. In other words, what the Supreme Court is saying, that government has a duty and an obligation and that it is correct in passing rules and regulations that prohibit the degradation of water quality. I believe that the only uh, alternative is the SOS ordinance, that it is conservative, uh, practical, easy to apply, fair, and that it will achieve the results with respect to maintaining water quality both in the watershed and in, at the springs. In general, I strongly support the SOS ordinance because it provides the greatest assurance that Barton Creek will remain the same in the future and that its quality will be preserved. June 1992. The city of Austin announces plans to construct a giant new sewer line across Barton Creek. It'll carry 7,000 gallons of sewage a minute, and it'll allow more real estate development outside the city limits. The plan is opposed by the head of the city's own Water Wastewater Commission, who says the line is guaranteed to eventually leak. Here's a question. They say Barton Creek is the soul of Austin. What happens to a city that sells its soul? <laughs>